I've been asked to talk to you about a very real problem in our community and to talk about why I have chosen to focus on an issue that is ugly and frankly embarrassing for our community and that is the issue of the commercial sexual exploitation of children. I've worked hard in our community to make sure we fully grasp and understand the true reality of the commercial sexual exploitation of children. CSEC, as we call it, is a battle that we cannot afford to lose. When I learned what CSEC truly was, when I learned it wasn't some abstract foreign issue, when I learned that our community is a hub for pimps to sell young girls night after night, I prioritized this issue at Multnomah County. Three years ago, through a grant from the Department of Justice, we formed a collaborative working group that brought together people and organizations working on the issue of human trafficking. Law enforcement, the district attorney's office, the victim's advocates, and community and faith-based organizations. Instead of working in silos, these groups work together, aligning their efforts in a way that is a national model for its efficacy. The work of the collaborative has centered on three main goals reducing demand, helping victims, and holding offenders accountable. To reduce demand, Multnomah County started a Sex Buyers Accountability and Diversion Program, also known as John School, to decrease the demand that funds this criminal industry. Since 2011, the program has been funded with user fees paid by the Johns, and more than 150 men have been through the class. To help victims, we have developed a system of care in Multnomah County that includes dedicated shelter beds, victim advocates, and police training to better recognize and support the victims. Finally, we have worked with the legislature to increase penalties for adults convicted of promoting or compelling prostitution. In February of this year, Deputy District Attorney J.R. Ujafusa made national news with the sentencing of a pimp to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This is a historic sentence and was the product of almost two years of investigation between all of the partners involved in the case. But we still have a long way to go. In August, U.S. Attorney Amanda Marshall and Portland State University released a study that revealed that over the last four years, 469 children have been trafficked for sex in the Portland metro area. This is the number of children who have been exploited, not the number of times sex occurred. This is important because we know that children are sold multiple times. I think some of the next steps must absolutely be focused on the demand issue related to CSEC and the prosecution of pimps. The PSU study confirmed what we had suspected, that there are close ties to gang activity. In fact, half of the active cases recorded for the study had a gang connection. We are all familiar with the idea of the commodities of gangs. In the past, they were predominantly drugs and guns the economics of gangs. When a gang member sells a gun, that's it. The money made from that sale is the most that gang member can make from that gun. For the next sale, the gang member has to acquire another gun or another bag of drugs. With young girls, gang members have found they can sell the same girl time and time again. The longer a girl works, the more money comes in. From a purely money-driven point of view, the economics of gangs is shifting to a new product, young women and girls. The PSU study provides a baseline to understand where we are now with regard to victims and CSEC activity in the community. And while it contains ugly truths, I hope that we will be able to demonstrate progress in the future. Conversations like this one happening today are a very important step in the right direction. Good afternoon, and welcome to League of Women Voters of East Multnomah County Public Information Meeting. Of, we're already in November, and we are having a forum about 
sex trafficking today. And today we have Kelly Cloyd. She's Deputy District Attorney with the Human Trafficking Team. I want to be sure I get all this detail in right. With the East Portland Police Precinct and with the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office. So we'll have time for questions. Kelly is open to questions during her talk and presentation, as well as time for question afterward. So thank you for joining us today. And Kelly, please share your information with us. Thank you. Uh, so I am one of three prosecutors who are focused on sex trafficking within Multnomah County. Um, originally, it had just been my position and our office kind of expanded when we realized what the scope of the problem is. And so now we have myself, who I'm stationed out at East Precinct with the Portland Police Bureau's Prostitution Coordination Team. Uh, we have a DA who is downtown in our domestic violence unit because a lot of the sex trafficking cases overlap into domestic violence issues. And then we also have a prosecutor who is assigned to our gang uh, prosecution unit because a lot of the gangs are getting involved in sex trafficking. Uh, so there's the three of us, and then we work with a couple different law enforcement agencies. Uh, there's downtown, there's the detectives for Portland Police Bureau who focus on uh, juvenile sex trafficking cases and then compelling prostitution, which is typically using force to um, cause an adult to engage in prostitution uh, or if a juvenile is being forced to engage or even just asked to engage in prostitution, uh, the detectives will get involved. And then the team that I work at with at East Precinct is the prostitution coordination team. And originally they started out as what we call a street team. They were just out on 82nd Avenue, which is one of our higher uh, vice areas, just trying to help get rid of what was thought of as just kind of a street prostitution problem at that point because it was really affecting the neighborhoods uh, and the poor kids couldn't go outside without being circled by Johns or finding condoms or um, syringes in their yards. So that's kind of where the PCT is the acronym for it started. And ultimately, they very quickly realized that this was not just women going out there and doing this on their own. There are traffickers who are forcing these women to be out there and may not be physically forcing, but it could be also some psychological forcing, which I can go into more of the detail of. So those are the two primary uh, Portland Police Bureau teams that I work with. My position has evolved a little bit, and I now work with um, East County as well, really just focusing on the prostitution and human trafficking problem out in East County. So I'm now working with the gang team in Gresham because they're seeing a lot of this with their gang members. And then uh, Troutdale, we're kind of focusing on the truck stop out there to see what kind of problem that's generating Fairview. So it's great to see that we're really trying to be proactive out in East County. So that's kind of what the prosecution slash law enforcement piece of it looks like. Uh, Portland has a very unique um, way of handling these cases in that uh, with the adult side of things, uh, when a, the PCT officers and there are four officers that are supposed to be on that team, they're looking at who the fourth person's gonna be right now. Right now there are three uh, and that's Mike Gallagher Andrea Etlin and Jeff Ruppel. Mike Gallagher is actually here today, uh, so you are, feel free to ask him questions too because he's just a wealth of knowledge. He's been doing this for about 18 years. Uh, so those three will uh, make an arrest if they see a, a victim who's out on the street. And before I kind of go into that, that sounds kind of bad when you say arrest and victim in the same sentence. The thing that these officers do is much more um, social work. They go out on the street or they run missions uh, online and bring girls into hotels to make contact with them and try and get them out of the lifestyle that involve, is involved in prostitution. And so oftentimes they'll contact a, an adult female five to six times before they even make an arrest, just trying to give her resources and get her out of uh, the game and get her into treatment and help her to be a productive member of society. And so five or six times in, when they run across her again and she's still not going out and voluntarily getting help herself, uh, they will make an arrest and then I review the case. 
I usually will issue um, charges for prostitution. And then the female has an opportunity to go into what we call the first time offender program, where she can plead guilty to the charge of prostitution and then um, go through like a one day class at LifeWorks, which is our treatment program. It's called LifeWorks Northwest, a new options for women and get services there. And it's just kind of an effort to get the female plugged into treatment services since she's not doing it on her own. Maybe she needs a little bit of a bump from the system. And then if she attends that class and remains arrest free for six months, then she can walk away without a conviction on her first time for being arrested. So we're trying to give the women as many possible opportunities to walk away without being, um, I guess, receiving the stigma that comes along with being convicted of a prostitution charge. After that, unfortunately, if they get picked up again, then sometimes they'll go on and be prosecuted through the system and then put on probation. And what that probation involves is a much more intensive treatment requirement. So they're in probation for about 18 months, and then they have to attend the full program at LifeWorks Northwest, New Options for Women. It's called the NOW program, so that's what I'll refer to it as. And they have mental health services, they have substance abuse services, they try and get the women housing, they give them mentors who will take them. Some of these women have never had identification before, so they'll take them down and they'll get them an Oregon ID card, take them through processes that we know because we've grown up in normal society, but a lot of these women have never been exposed to. So they do a very holistic approach to trying to get the woman out of the life and then help her to learn how to um, kind of adapt and integrate into our society. So that's kind of the prosecution track for the adult females. Um, we do not like to arrest or go through a prosecution on juveniles. Uh, it's not necessarily um, the most appropriate way of handling it because they are, you know, 14, 15, 16 year old kids. Uh, and so we just try and get them into the DHS system if they don't have a parental unit or get them back to parents or get them to shelters and try and get them treatment. And for that piece of it, we have the Sexual Assault Resource Center, which um, the acronym is for SARC. And they actually have an advocate program where the advocates can be called up 24 hours a day. Say the officers are out running a mission, 12 o'clock at night, they run into a 14-year-old girl who's being trafficked. They can actually call up one of these advocates. An advocate will respond to the hotel where they found the girl, and she will make that connection right then and there, and then walk the girl through the process of any kind of treatment she needs, any prosecution stuff that she's involved in, all of that. And so it's kind of like a built-in best friend for these girls so that they have a partner and a family to go through the system with. So that's what we focus on for the juveniles. And then, yes. So do you work with adults only, it no. sounds like? I work with, um, because I work with the prostitution coordination team, I work with a lot of adults. Okay. And when I say adults, I always like to caveat that the adults are still victims, just like the juveniles, because about 90% of these women uh, were sexually abused as children. And so that growth process stopped at that point when they were 12 and just never started. And so you've got a 32 year old, but her mentality is like a 12 year old. Uh, so I work with the prostitution coordination team on that. And that's kind of why I've talked about the adult piece of it. But then we do work with the, I do work with the juvenile part of it uh, because the detectives make the arrests on the juvenile cases and they run into girls uh, who are 14, 15. And we get tips from, you know, community members and churches or, you know, DHS who are finding these girls, and we prosecute those as well. Um, my prosecution is not of the girls, though. It's going to be of the trafficker with the juveniles uh, and walking those pimps through the process. And these, the trafficker cases are huge. They're, in terms of the amount of documentation and work involved, they're a lot more like murder cases because you have... Um, records that you're subpoenaing from not only the websites that the girls are posted on, but financial records, all sorts of things. And so your typical tra trafficker case is probably two binders, at least big, of just documents. And they take about a week. And so you're really focusing on the pimp 
and the trafficker, and I like to call them traffickers because I think that pimp is a word that is something that's very glamorized in our society, and I don't think that it's something that's appropriate for what these guys are doing because these guys are the worst of the worst. So I am involved in the prosecution, but there's a little bit more prosecution involved in the adult female, female side of it than there is the juvenile side of it. Juveniles were focusing on the traffickers. Um, and then we also focus on the demand side of it, which are the sex buyers. And we have a program that when a sex buyer is arrested and has pled guilty or been convicted, he has to go through what we term as um, John school is the most common school that we call, or name that we call it, but it's uh, the sex buyers accountability and diversion program is what we call it. And it's a one day course where we have SARC and we have the prostitution coordination team and myself uh, and all sorts of people who are in the know and see how this life works come in and talk to a room full of 30 sex buyers and explain the fact that these women are not voluntarily engaged in this and the health ramifications that can happen because they slept with a girl without a protection and took it home to their family and just educating them. And we've done pre-surveys and post-surveys of the sex buyers at before and after the class, and we're seeing a difference in their viewpoint on sex trafficking from the beginning to the end and realizing, oh, this is not, prostitution is not a victimless crime. So that's kind of the prosecution law enforcement piece of it in a nutshell. It's kind of long to go through. So um, just an overview, and I'll try and move through this quickly, is uh, that sex trafficking does occur, occur locally. It's um, nationally, and it's a lot of it is U.S.-born children. It's not that many imported international children is what we're finding. It's our kids in our own backyard. Um, I'll go through what's kind of happening on the streets, uh, what the traffickers are doing to bring victims in, what the victims look like, the process that they use to get them to go out and sell themselves, and then what kind of steps communities members can take in getting involved in this process. So humans recycled and resold. Um, humans are now the second most lucrative commodity traded illegally. This is just after drugs. So it goes drugs and then humans. Uh, one out of every three teens on the street will be lured into prostitution within 48 hours of leaving home. And statistically, this means at least 150,000 children are lured into prostitution each year. So it's a major problem within the United States. Yes. Well, if that many people are lured into prostitution, then why? Why? Because we have a lot of vulnerable teens out there. Um, the victims, and I'll get this into this a little bit more in depth, are children uh, or teenage girls. There are boys that this happens to as well uh, that have insecurities, and these traffickers are very good at playing on those insecurities and spotting them and acting like a boyfriend, and they that trafficker may be the only person in that girl's life that has ever cared about her or she feels has ever cared about her or provided for her. And so that trafficker knows how to fill a need that has been a big void in these girls' lives. So that's kind of how they get plugged in with it. And I'll kind of spend some time on that. Um, so Portland's a pretty popular place for sex trafficking. Um, we have several high vice areas, which is 82nd Avenue, Sandy Boulevard, Burnside, and Everett in Northwest, and then uh, Southwest Stark and Burnside. So it's not just happening on 82nd, but that's been the most popular place that people know of uh, where it's happening, but it is happening all over the city. It happens in Gresham. It happens at 181st and Stark is the street uh, prostitution, it happens in the Motel 6 there. It happens uh, in the motels up by the I-84. So it's happening in Gresham as well. It's happening in Troutdale at the Motel 6 by the truck stop out there. So it's happening all over. Yes? <laughs> I'm just, I, I, I've already forgot three questions, so I'm going to stop you. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> um, it sounds like you're being proactive in Gresham. Does Gresham have less sex trafficking per capita than Portland? You know, I don't know the answer to that because um, this is something that Gresham is just starting to really address. Um, I think one of the primary reasons Portland became so involved with it 
uh, very quickly is because it was such a huge issue on 82nd Avenue with the neighborhood associations getting involved and being upset that they couldn't walk outside without checking their yard for needles and condoms. Uh, so I think Portland got a head start on it just because of that. So Gresham and I have been working together um, very quickly to kind of catch up and to do some more original type things that are specific to Gresham. Um, so I don't know the answer to that yet, but it definitely happens out there. I've got, um, I'll show you kind of the ads. And when you search into one of the websites uh, and look for ads in Gresham, there's a ton of them that pop up in Gresham as well. Um, and I guess I might as well just talk about that a little bit now. Um, there are a couple different websites that are used for advertising prostitution related activities. The pimps or the, the traffickers will go on and post ads online and then the girls will be sent out to the hotel room when a sex buyer calls up to make a date. And so um, primary ones are backpage.com and TNA board that we've used. And this is the last 24 hours worth of links on backpage.com. <laughs> So this is since noon at yesterday. And then on TNA board, we just did, we didn't limit it to 24 hours, but we looked at all of the ads that are posted on there for Portland. Um, this is just a little bit of it because this is one little small packet of 896 pages worth of links to advertisements for prostitution related activities. And then when you search Gresham uh, in TNA board, you get one of 57 pages. So it's happening out here just as it's happening in Portland. Kelly, what is the age of the, of the I don't know if you use the term John still or, or the, uh, it, is it te teenage up to? It's, we haven't had an arrest for a minor sex buyer at this point. But so we're seeing, but we're seeing as young as 18, because that's what you do when you go out and turn 18 as a young guy in our society is, you know, it's common to go down to Vegas and you purchase a, a prostitute, right? I mean, that's kind of a societal norm. And that's part of the why this has been just so prolific, I think, in our societies. In some respects, it's very much accepted. And then um, we're seeing all the way up to 70, 80 years old, even. So it's a very broad range. And there was a study done um, by the Arizona State University, and I'll bring that up in those numbers. They kind of looked at Portland a little bit and what they think our population and percentage of sex buyers is. Um, part of the problem with Portland uh, is that we have a lot of all-nude strip clubs. Portland's pretty unique in that you don't have to, in the strip club area, you don't have to cover anything up. They can be naked. Uh, and so that's unique to Portland. And we have 50 all nude strip clubs within the city limits of Portland. Um, one directory lists 40 erotic dance clubs, 47 all nude, and then 35 adult businesses and 21 laundry modeling shops where the girls will actually come out in the laundry and model it. Uh, a lot of trafficking happens out of there. A lot of recruitment happens out of the nude dance clubs where the traffickers will go to the club to watch a girl dance and then be like, hey, you know. Let's go do this and make you a little bit more money. So that's one way that girls are lured into this. Um, the I-5 corridor makes it very easy to travel from Seattle to Portland to Eugene to Medford, down to California, over to Arizona. It, they make this very big circuit, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, um, Las Vegas. I think North Dakota somehow is becoming a very big place for this. Uh, so it happens everywhere, and so it's this big traveling, and so the traffickers will actually have their set circuit that they send their girls on, um, and it just gets you more money if you're new to that area and you're not one of the regular girls that the sex buyers are seeing all the time. So that's another issue. And then we've had some national exposure. I don't know how many of you saw the documentary with Dan Rather about porn land uh, and our problem. and. Um, it's a big issue here, and it may have been a little bit over-exaggerated in terms of the dirtiness that he's talking about in Portland, but we have a huge sex trafficking problem in this area. Um, and then one of the officers uh, who had just been, a, he'd been a cop for forever in Portland, had been on 29 years and didn't believe 
that you could go to a food court and pick up a 14 year old and then three hours later she's selling herself these that's how good these traffickers are at what they do part of the issue is that Oregon has freedom of expression that is um, part of where the the strip club piece of it comes is it's our freedom of expression and you know if there was no trafficking that occurred out of there then you know that's that's fine but we are having victims pulled out of those strip clubs and so it's something that needs to be addressed and law enforcement's working on how to get into those clubs and parse out what is I don't want to say innocent behavior and expression versus uh, the trafficking that occurs out of there um, so this is where I was going to show you all of the TNA and Backpage ads, but that's kind of, that's the amount of, uh, sex trafficking that we have. And that's only the online. That's not including any of the things that are out on the street because there are some girls that will just go and walk what they call the track, which is the area where like 82nd Avenue, you walk up and down it, just waiting for a guy to circle and, uh, pick you up is how they'd work the street stuff. Um, so Traffickers motivations, they are motivated by money and status. Like I said, pimp is something that is glamorized in our society of 50 Cent who has sings P-I-M-P. -P. And if you actually look up what those lyrics are, you can learn everything you need to know about what the sex trafficking dyna dynamic is between a pimp and his girl because he talks about it in his lyrics there. Um, and girls make a lot of money, especially juveniles. And so that gets these guys their lifestyle. Um, and the cars they drive and all of the clothes that they wear. And there's just an example of what they get from sex trafficking is all of this stuff. And I can point out, girls don't keep the money. You can ask a victim if she keeps the money and she'll say, yeah, I make lots of money. But when you actually ask her where that money is, she doesn't physically have that. Sometimes she gets five bucks to go and eat at McDonald's during the day but she doesn't have that. She's not saving enough. She's not getting to go out and buy those nice shoes. When she gets the nice shoes, it's because the trafficker says, oh, you've done good and you've met your quota for the day. And so I'll go buy you something nice. So that's the level of control these guys have over the victims. So there are three stages to um, how traffickers victimize and go through the process. Um, there's recruiting stage, the breaking stage, and then the maintenance stage. So recruiting is finding the victim. And as I pointed out earlier, they look for vulnerable victims. So primarily they're looking for minors. Um, the average age of entry is 12 to 14. Um, but they can look at a, a, an adult female as well and say, you know, she'd be really easy to do this. Or, you know, adult females tend to hop between traffickers as well. Uh, and so they'll look for um, girls who are just have huge insecurities. So you'll see girls who are from runaway homes and um, have gone through the DHS system, um, have been sexually or verbally assaulted, very low self-esteem. Um, and the history of sex abuse for is kind of a plus for traffickers because then the girl's already acclimatized to that sort of behavior. Her um, sexuality is not within the normal uh, parameters. It's something that it's easier to push her into the sex trafficking and say, oh, this, it's okay if you go and sleep with a guy for money um, than it, it would be to a girl who has never had any experience with that. Um, Traffickers know that they're good at what they do. They'll recruit girls out of schools and malls and bus stops. Um, social networking site, Facebook is a big one right now that we're seeing um, kind of evolve. Uh, shelters, you'll have victims um, who are minors that get picked up for something. They'll go into a shelter for the night, and then there will be another girl there who's working for a trafficker. And that other girl will say, hey, I'm making all this money. This is a great life because she thinks – that it is because she's been brainwashed and then she'll get this other girl to come with her and then all of a sudden he's got two girls out of that shelter. Um, and then like I said, then that girl is typically kind of the bottom girl, one of the, the girls that uh, the trafficker will trust to kind of run some of his business and maybe manipulate other girls into coming to work for him. There's a lot of psychological um, manipulation that happens. Like I said, these girls are girls that may not have ever had anybody in their life that they felt like truly cared about them. And so this trafficker is going to be that person and 
there are girls out there that, you know, maybe a trafficker was physically violent to them and they're much more willing to talk about that guy because he was mean to them and he hit them and abused them physically. But then you've got a guy that she worked for, you know, five years ago that she still won't talk about and still wants to kind of protect because he convinced her that he was the love of her life. That's how in these, in their heads, these guys are. Um, and it doesn't just happen to DHS kids. I do want to point that out. It, it happens to normal teenagers as well. Name one female teenager or even some male teenagers that don't have insecurities and who couldn't be made to feel better about themselves. And then you're vulnerable to a trafficker. So um, traffickers, like I was talking about with the money, um, they'll also take forms of ID. Um, they will say, hey, let's go to a trip. Let's go to Vegas um, and get them away from, say, they live in Portland, get them away from their families and their support system in Portland and take them away from that. And then it's hard for the girl to even get back to a support system to get out of the life. Uh, some of I've heard of traffickers when girls are sleeping to exert control over them, they'll put their hands over the girl's mouth and nose so that she just wakes up a little bit but doesn't wake up enough to realize what's going on when she can't breathe. And they'll sit there and they'll do that all night long so that the girl's the next tired the next day and doesn't really have the will to then kind of fight or disobey. That's how much control these guys will wield over their victims. There's branding that goes on as well. Um, you'll see many tattoos Girls will have the guys' names on them, on their neck, uh, on their back of their ear, right across their chest where it says the guy's name so that when she looks in the mirror, she knows who he, she belongs to. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then we have the breaking stage. So at least um, we have two different types of traffickers that we talk about. There's finesse traffickers, which are your psychological man manipulators. They're really nice. They typically are kind of the boyfriend to the girl. Uh, and then we have your, what we call gorilla pimps, uh, who are the ones that will just be so mean and violent that the girl's afraid she's going to die if she doesn't do what it is that he wants. Um, this breaking stage really uh, applies a lot to the finesse uh, trafficker. And once he's kind of gotten in with her and she's somebody or he's somebody that she trusts, then oh, we don't have enough money to, you know, pay rent this month. Can you go do this for me because I love you? Um, or he'll become a little bit more aggressive and make her go out and do this. Um, but it's a lot of psychological manipulation to um, get the girl to go out and make money. Um, some of them are raped by him or a friend and then say, okay, well, you've already you know, done this. You're not good enough. Go out and make money. It's not that different. Uh, so it's, it's a very ugly, very violent time or at least violent psychologically as well. Um, victims usually have a monetary quota that they're supposed to meet for the day. Uh, we do a lot of phone downloads and looking through those downloads, you'll see, hey, when can I come in from the girl? And he'll say, not till you reach 300 or not till you reach a thousand. Uh, and so the girls are supposed to actually meet that amount before they're allowed to stop. Um, and then there are rules that the girls are supposed to follow. And um, that includes don't talk to um, other guys who may be traffickers. Um, you have to give me all of your money. Um, some of them are punished There's a, physically by beatings, uh, or sometimes that shows marks, right? And so they'll put them in the corner and make them stand in the corner like you would a five-year-old until the trafficker feels like the girl has learned her lesson. So that's kind of the stuff that goes on. Um, and that kind of leads into the kind of maintenance phase as well and keeping that control and I'm always going to be the one in charge. A lot of these girls call their trafficker daddy. Um, if that tells you kind of the relationship, they're an authoritative figure. So I wanted to talk about the demand side of this too, because that's the other big problem. And even if we got rid of the traffickers, I mean, maybe it would be an okay thing, but we still have this demand side that is really enabling the traffickers to engage in this behavior and make money off of this. So, um, excuse me, yes. just one last question. What, what is the, 
Is there an average length of time that the girls in the sex trafficker have that relationship? Is there, is it five years? Ten? You know, I don't know if there's an average length of time there. Are, what typically happens is um, if the girl gets away from that trafficker without any inf intervention, uh, then she'll just get picked up by another one and they hop from trafficker to trafficker. Um, and some of them are with their traffickers for a very long time. And then some of them, I mean, I, I kind of started dealing with this issue in 2011. And there was a girl that I came across in the unit where I was at, um, that she, I was prosecuting her trafficker for a different charge. And she'd already had one before that. She had this one, and then now she's had at least two more since then that we've seen, and she just kind of hops every single time one of them gets arrested. She'll go, and somebody else will pick her up because you see her, they see her, and they know that she's vulnerable, and she's easy to, to take. Without intervention, that's not likely to be broken. Yeah, because these girls don't know how to reintegrate into the community and really get away from it. And the officers end up playing social worker mm -hmm. a lot of the time to try and get the girls out of it because they're the ones who are the first point of contact oftentimes. So they do a good job of that, but we need community members to uh, be able to step up and help to provide services that are gonna help transition these victims out of that life and into a more normal societal life. Um, so the demand side of it, um, Arizona State University did a study that they published in August of this year and what they did is they posted ads on one of those websites that I told you about in 15 different cities. Uh, and they did it um, one week apart in each city. And so response to the ads in Portland, um, they had 79 total calls for the ads, um, including duplicate calls. Um, and that was seven days each ad or two ads. So uh, the number of text messages they had was 23. So we had 79 calls, 23 text messages, and 58 voicemails out of Portland when they posted an ad here. Uh, and then the percentage of those calls that had like a 503 area code or a Portland area code was 54.7%. So about half those people that were calling uh, the Portland ads were in theory from Portland. Three point seven percent of males in Portland um, were who called the sex ads, uh, and Portland ranked the ninth out of the fifteen U.S. cities that they had done this study in. Uh, the estimated number uh, population in Portland of sex buyers was thirty-one thousand two hundred and eighty-two, and then the average number of ads posted on what back page, which is the long, tall one that I showed you in a 24 hour period was 145.5 ads. So if that shows you kind of where we're at with the demand side of it, it's huge. Um, we're trying to do a lot to fight that, but it's a big fight because you go out on 82nd and even if you're just watching for sex buyers, they're a dime a dozen. You know, and they'll, the officers will do, prostitution coordination team will do missions where they'll post an ad online and um, have guys call up trying to purchase a girl for sex. And they'll make seven to eight arrests easy within like a three and a three hour, four hour period. And they still have guys calling up at the end of the night and still wanting to set up dates. And we made arrests even the week after we ran the ad just because guys are still responding to that. So any questions about that? Okay. Um, yes. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, now I assume these are adults who are trying to get, okay. Uh, is what kind of intervention can you do or do you do mm -hmm. with these Purchasers? Sure, purchasers. <laughs> um, so with the purchasers or buyers, um, as we end up calling them most of the time, we're doing that same kind of first-time offender program that we do with the 
victims, the adult victims, in that because these are normal guys. These are not necessarily um, a specific income level or specific occupation. We've had from construction workers to ER doctors is the demographic of these purchasers. Uh, and so they are often deterred by kind of low level um, punishment because this is normal life for them. Like th this kind of conviction is going to affect their normal lives at a very high level. And so they get an opportunity to plead guilty go through the John school that I was talking about and learn from, you know, the police and myself what, about what it is that would happen if they, act, they picked up a minor, even if it was an accident, if they purchased a minor for sex, they could be sex offenders. We just passed a lot. It's a felony to purchase a minor now in <coughs> Oregon, which is awesome because it wasn't before. Uh, and so, we educate them on that. We educate them on the trafficker dynamic so that they know that the victims aren't out there just saying, hey, I like sex. I'm going to go sell myself and make some money, that these girls aren't actually getting the money, um, that they can take some of these things home to their family. Um, you know, they have a girl sitting in the front seat who has crabs, and then their 12-year-old gets in the front seat after that. I mean, that kind of thing. And I'm not trying to be graphic, but we want them to know what this world looks like. And I think a good portion of them after walking out of that class then know that this is not a victimless crime and that it's a really ugly world out there and they should probably just stay away from it. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do to educate them. They can't be arrested for six months um, from the date of their plea. And then if they remain arrest free and they attend that class, and it's $1,000 to attend that class, um, and part of that, a good chunk of that money goes to the treatment program for the victims. So they're actually helping to fund the treatment program for the victims when they attend that class. Uh, and then at the end of it, if they obey everything, they can walk away without a conviction and just be done. If they get caught again, they get put on probation. They get excluded from all our high vice areas. They're not allowed to access any of the websites that, you know, do the prostitution related activities. They have to go through the John school again. Uh, and pay another thousand dollars and then they're subject to being picked up by police officers if they see them doing something wrong so if the guy's on probation for this he's out on 82nd trying to pick up a girl again then an officer sees that the officer can arrest him and he has to sit in jail for two weeks waiting for the court to have a hearing on his probation violation so that really helps, I think, in terms of deterrence because two weeks maybe in one of these girls' lives isn't that long because they don't have that structure and that normal job and that family. But with these guys, they can lose their job. Their wife's obviously going to find out if they're missing for two weeks because half of them are married. And so it just – that has a huge deterrence effect. So that's what we're trying to do. And I think education is huge. We're trying to get a lot of education out there to the general public because – I think that if guys really heard what happens and what goes on, they may think about it before they it, they just do it. Because I think there are a lot of purchasers who don't think about the fact that this is victimizing people. It's just about them and their needs. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but it leads to another question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, correct, stop me if I'm incorrect. Um, it costs $1,000 to take this class. Mm -hmm. How much does it cost to have sex with one of these people that have been sex trafficked? Okay. Yes. Um, it depends on if you're in a hotel or on the street, um, but we're talking anywhere from uh, $15 to $20 for a small sex act to $150 for a half hour to an hour worth of what we call full service, which is sex. Okay. That would you pay a thousand dollars or fifteen or twenty dollars? That's kind of the thing I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. Is all right. I don't care. You know, it's it's money that talks. And if right, you have to pay a thousand dollars to get so called cured, mm -hmm. uh, which they aren't probably, uh, or twenty dollars to keep on doing what you're doing. What are you going to do? Which one are you? Well, they're going to keep on doing it until we catch them. Yeah, that's and then, right. 
hopefully, you know, that's enough. And the nice thing is that the new crime that came out, um, which is purchasing sex with a minor, if a guy gets caught for um, purchasing sex with a minor, it's now a felony. Uh, the court has discretion to make them register as sex offenders, and they have to pay a minimum of a $10,000 fine. Uh, and so you've got three big things that your average Joe Schmo is not going to want to deal with. And so I think getting that information out there is huge because that in and of itself could serve as a deterrent. Did you have a question? Uh, yes. Has um, this first-time offender um, program been pretty effective? I think so. In looking at the um, – we, we don't have a way of measuring the recidivism piece of it. At this point, um, we're looking at how to figure that out. But we've seen um, in doing our surveys a difference in their attitude from the beginning of the class to the end of the class. And you can look, I sit through the all day of it, and you can look around the room and you see the guys are pretty anti-participatory in the beginning. And by the end of it, a good chunk of them are actually asking questions, and you can see a change in their body posture about how they're receiving the information. And then there's an area that's for comments in our survey, and some of the comments are phenomenal. Um, that you can tell that you know anywhere from the prosecution piece of it and what I could be charged with is enough to get me to stop doing this. Um, some of them were have said wow, walking in a victim's shoes for a day has just been, you know, life-changing. I'll never do this again. Some have asked how to help. So we are reaching, obviously reaching, a good population of the ones that are caught in having to go through this class. So I'm hoping that that means that recidivism is down or going down. So the, the re-arrest rate, is, is that down? We haven't had that many that we've rearrested. I would say, um, I can't say it's down, but I can say that the bulk of the guys that we've arrested, I would say we've arrested a much smaller group of them again. So there are a couple that are on probation um, because they went through the first time offender program and then didn't and got arrested again and are now on probation and have been picked up and put in jail for two weeks when we've seen them violating it because they have violated their probation. So, But I would say that percentage is much smaller than the initial percentage of the guys that were arresting. Kelly, how contradictory is this here in Oregon? And I believe in, in Nevada that prostitution is legal. Is that still the case? Um, it is in certain parts of Nevada. Um, prostitution is legal, but I um, there's a victim who is lives down in Grants Pass who was trafficked, and she was taken down to Las Vegas and trafficked down there. And I can tell you from the stories that she has um, told me and told, tells the public when she speaks, it was not a voluntary thing on her part. And so even though it may be legal, uh, it didn't solve the problem for her because he would still beat her if uh, she misbehaved and um, all sorts of illegal stuff that was going on around it. And so it's, my argument to that would just be that without, if the traffickers were gone, maybe it would be an okay thing because we wouldn't have the violence and all of the, the criminal stuff that goes along with it. But it, it, so far, we haven't seen that. There's no way it's not a victimless crime. At this point, <laughs> no. Any, not without any. some major societal <laughs> shift, I would yeah. say. Um, so one of the reasons that I mentioned to you guys was that um, why this problem continues after a trafficker is arrested is there's a lot of um, intimidation that goes on of these victims. Uh, in fact, we've had to have um, the Sexual Assault Resource Center, all of their victim advocates had to come in and sit on a trial one time because this guy had so many friends at, coming in to support him and intimidate her when she was in the courtroom. So it's not an easy process for these girls to go through when they actually have to go through the prosecution of it. Um, but even if we can get them through the prosecution piece of it, what happens to them after we're done? Because at that point, in theory, the criminal justice system is supposed to step back and the officers and I are supposed to step back and let her go and do her thing, which 
is difficult, you know, because we've helped to get them through the process, but then there's nothing for them to go to. So that's kind of where the community comes in to play. Oops. And I would say that without safety, long-term care, and support, the victim's just going to fall prey to another trafficker is what we end up seeing and ha happening. Um, we have one girl right now who everybody is in her corner and trying to keep her out of this and keep her away from these bad influences, but it takes a village for sure to keep her out of everything. So um, current resources, like I said, is LifeWorks Northwest New Options for Women program, uh, the Sexual Assault Resource Center, and those are kind of the two more criminal justice-based ones, but they don't have to be engaged in any kind of prosecution in order for the victims to attend those programs. So that's really great because the girl could just go there on her own to get help, and we do have women and children who are doing that. Um, Janet's Youth Services provides some shelters for um, underage victims, um, but like I said, we have to be careful with shelters too because there could be other victims in there that are still within the life and are trying to recruit because their traffickers is getting them to try and recruit. But Janice does a great job of having, they have beds there that are available for girls. Um, Hope 82 is a nonprofit that goes out on 82nd and provides you know, a candy bar or like a granola bar to a girl because maybe she hasn't eaten for 24 hours because she hasn't met her quota and her trafficker's mad at her uh, or water bottles or just, you know, hey, if you need somebody to talk to, here's our card, call our number. Um, and then House of Engetti just is opening up. It'll be the first adult shelter that is going to be available. We have, Up until now, the only shelters that we've had available for adult women was if you could get them into some inpatient treatment facility because they have a substance abuse problem. We didn't have any kind of shelter that these women could go to. Uh, so that's going to be huge. And they're going to have a little center on 82nd for women to go and learn how to do resumes and different things where they can check in and just kind of veer off 82nd for a little while. And then there will be a house somewhere uh, that will be safe that these women can go to and just completely exit from things. Um, and then community groups specifically that have taken some action. Rotary, uh, they have soap that they've gotten. And um, the soap, when you open it up, has information for victims to contact, like a phone number where they can call to get resources or help. Um, getting out of the life and that soap looks normal on the outside and then it's got those resources on the inside and Rotary's tried to get that soap into hotel rooms where these girls are so that when they go into the bathroom to wash their hands or do whatever they open it up and there's this victim information that they can use to contact um, and then Rotary also paid for which was phenomenal advertisements on the back of buses that run in East County uh, that said sex trafficking hurts. And then uh, there was another one that had a picture of a sex purchaser in handcuffs that says, Dear John, uh, our relationship with your relationship with our neighborhood is over. So they ran those on buses for a little while, which was great. Um, Junior League just got done doing a documentary on sex trafficking in Portland that um, they did a, great, a lot of great work on. Um, Epic, which is a group that is focused on the buyer part of it, and um, it's made up of males who are against purchasing. Uh, they are going online and really trying to contact Johns who are calling up females to deter them from doing this and just do that educational piece of this. And then um, a lot of faith-based organizations, churches, um, have actually taken victims into their congregation and are helping to support them through the healing process or provide them with resources and food and different things like that. And then how can you help? So education um, of just the general population and public is huge because I think a lot of these people, a lot of community members don't know the extent of the problem, the violence that's involved, the psychological manipulation, and that prostitution isn't a victimless crime. Um, I know I didn't know the extent of it before I started prosecuting these cases. Um, and my mom, when talking to her about this kind of stuff, is always just shocked when I'm telling her what it is that I'm seeing, you know. So I'm sure there's a, a huge amount of community awareness, awareness that needs to take place. Um, prevention is also another big thing that we need help with. 
Um, a lot of these girls are high school, middle school students, and just getting information into a, a context and a location where teenagers can learn what this behavior looks like and know when they've got a guy coming up to them that may be 23, 24, and she thinks he's really cool, uh, that that may be a red flag, not just something that's supposed to be flattering. Um, so there are a number of groups that are, are doing that piece of it. How proactive are the school, lo our local school districts in, in working with this issue up front and so making... making there are probably three or four schools that actually have curriculum that is going to be, they're trying to implement in there and get in there. But it's a fairly new process and program and everything. So it's definitely something that I'm hoping to see is wider spread, but it's not very widespread at this point. But there are a couple of schools that are higher risk that we've tried to get programs into. And SARC, the Sexual, Account, uh, Sexual Assault Resource Center, they have been very proactive in coming up with an educational curriculum and trying to get that into the schools. Um, and the county actually has a person who's, uh, CSEC is the acronym that they like to use for sexually trafficked children. Um, so it's commercially sexually exploited children is what CSEC stands for. And we actually have a coordinator who, with the county, who helps to kind of coordinate these different groups and help people to get plugged in so we don't just have a bunch of small groups going off and doing little things that everybody can get organized and actually do something that is make, very impactful. Um, and then volunteer with treatment services. Um, like I said, SARC has that um, advocacy program where the officers can call up at you know 12 o'clock at night and get an advocate to come out and uh, meet with a girl. There's nothing like that for adults, and they're starting to do that. Um, but SARC always needs volunteers, and then LifeWorks will need volunteers to kind of help meet with adults or even, you know, just go have a cup of coffee with somebody, a girl who's finally ready to almost graduate their program and is ready to kind of integrate into society. And even the language, the F bomb and the, you know, the S. H-I-T, and all of those vulgar words are normal vocabulary for these women because that's the world that they live in. And so just learning even basic things like not cussing every other word is huge and being able to have a normal conversation with somebody. Um, and then gift cards are another thing. Um, oftentimes these girls don't have resources for food because they haven't made their quota um, and so the officers are a lot of times able to get gift card donations and then can give those out to the girls when they're hungry and out on the street and need help. Um, my favorite story, and I repeat this all the time, is uh, I go out with the officers every once in a while and see what they do and because I think it helps me to prosecute these cases better. And we went out one night and there was a girl who was out working uh, and the reason she was out working that night uh, was because... She didn't have the money to get her kid a birthday present or throw him a birthday party uh, the next week when their, her kid was turning eight. And so fortunately, we saw her get in a car and went over and stopped the car and contacted her, ultimately took her home without placing her under arrest. And between all of the community groups that we work with, we're able to get her a bicycle and balloons and a birthday cake and a whole entire party and take it the next Tuesday when it was her kid's birthday and throw a birthday party. And one of the officers, you know, sings happy birthday through the loudspeaker. And so that's the kind of work that needs to be done, but we can't do it without the community support that has been out there and that people are really starting to get involved in. So any questions? Yes. Well, um, how about the county government and Metro also? Um, are, are they being very uh, supportive and are they trying to um, come up with additional legislation or mm -hmm. are they supportive of, of what uh, your group is doing? The county has been phenomenal. Um, they really stepped up this, this year and uh, that's the reason I'm out here in Gresham and able to prosecute as broadly as I am is because the county has just been phenomenal in backing everything. Um, Portland had been even paying for my position um, up until a little while ago, and so they've been very progressive with it. So 
so far local government's been very supportive. Um, like I said, we just got that new legislation passed this last year, uh, which is phenomenal because it was the same level crime to purchase a minor as it was an adult up until July of this year. And now it's a felony to purchase a minor. So we've had really good support for the most part. And Portland's got two different teams. Gresham's been really great. Their gang team is involved. Their special enforcement team is involved. Their detectives are wanting to be involved. So it's really neat to see the different agencies and everybody, even non-governmental agencies, kind of come together around this issue because it's not something we can prosecute or arrest our way out of. And it's not something that community groups could just do something about, I think, without the law enforcement side at this point anyway. Is there other um, legislation that would be helpful, that would be would increase the um, effectiveness? Or the law that was just passed, is it pretty good? It's, it's pretty good. Um, there were some, ultimately, I think it, it turned out okay. Um, we were trying to make it a little bit tougher um, because right now there's a defense built into it. Um, if you purchase a 16 or 17-year-old, we have to prove that you, the buyer reasonably believed that the girl was under 18. Uh, it's not just a strict liability. You purchase a 17-year-old and you get convicted. So they have a little bit of a defense. So it's a little bit lower than we would have liked to see, but um, it was fought really hard for, and I think it turned out pretty well. Um, Legislation-wise, I think it just is continuing to support what it is that we're doing when we're finding new problems uh, that aren't working out and we need help with getting community groups to back us on, you know, I know that you, that you cannot legislate, you know, we can't legislate our way out of, of a whole number of problems. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just pass laws. And and yes, I would guess community involvement Absolutely. could make quite a difference. And it's great working with community members um, because there are certain things that we know and recognize as law enforcement and prosecutors that you would never know as a community member and there are certain things that all of you know and how to address things and different problems that you can address that we can't address as government or law enforcement. So I think it's a great working partnership. That's encouraging. <laughs> I think the neighborhood associations and, and neighborhood coalition that we have here in Gresham mm -hmm. uh, have opportunity to play a key role in educating the public and in addressing this at their meetings mm -hmm. and getting information out and absolutely and uh, helping people realize this is not a victimless crime mm -hmm. and that it is a crime yes and so um, are there any other questions i'd like to know how are those girls housed do the pimps or the traffickers take care of them in terms of housing Yes, yeah, some of them, it's a, a boyfriend relationship. Some of the girls live with other girls, depending on how many um, girls the trafficker has. Um, so they could all just be in an apartment. Um, if she doesn't make enough money for the night, she could end up sleeping just out on the street. Uh, hotels are pretty common for the girls to end up just staying in. Uh, so that's kind of the housing situation with the guy. And if he's got one girl, some of them are very much boyfriend, girlfriend type relationships and that he's just got one girl working for him. And which case typically you kind of see them live together. Uh, if he's got five or six girls working for him, sometimes it's just those five or six girls in an apartment together. Um, and he may be somewhere else. Is there any age limit where they're no longer valuable? <laughs> uh, you know, if they're making money to these guys, they're valuable. And no yeah, we have some some women who are they recognize that they're a little bit older in the process and what they might be a little aged out. Um, and they have told us recently that they've had young guys coming up to them and trying to recruit them. And their response has literally been, I'm not worth anything. Like that's not, you know, I'm aged out. You don't want this, but that's kind of, that tells you also the broadness of the problem and how many people are trying to be involved in it. It seems to be kind of the big up and coming new thing for 
people to try and be involved in. There, there are more beneficial businesses. Yes, <laughs> to say the yes, least. there are. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to conclude and thank you for bringing thank this you. information to us. And when Shirley asked the question about the county and the city governments, I would just like to add that Commissioner Diane McKill from East County is, has been very involved from the beginning with realizing that this is a huge issue. So we just want to thank our audience for watching us on Metro East Community Media. It's another great community partnership that gets this information out into the community. And we appreciate that so much. And also at the end of the program, you'll have information about League of Women Voters of East Multnomah County. Please like us on Facebook. We're working on membership uh, in many different ways, not just attending a, at a meeting, but also being able to go on our website. And I do believe that this will be uh, a link on our website, your presentation. So um, please encourage your friends and neighbors and families to find out about this issue in our community that is not a victimless crime. So thank you very much for watching League of Women Voters of East Multnomah County program. Thank you again, Kelly. Thank you.